Lesson three on knowing the whole counsel of God has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know the whole counsel of God, and specifically God's redemptive plan of salvation, you've got to know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be absolutely positive that in Paul's mind, Jesus Christ is front and center of the whole counsel of God. Uh, you need to know the following key passages of Scripture and be able to point people to these texts when they've got questions about who Jesus is, what He came to do, uh, the things concerning Himself. Let's, let's just first begin with what Jesus says about Himself. Don't miss the astonishing claim that Jesus is making. He claims that the Old Testament prophets, we looked at this in the last session, uh, the Law of Moses, the Psalms, all, all spoke of Him. Luke 22, 44. Or 24, 44. In Luke 24, to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke records, quote, He interpreted to them uh, all in, in all the scriptures the things concerning Himself. That's what Luke records. And, and you have to wonder who would do this. If this isn't true, then this is an insane thing for Jesus to do. He's essentially claiming that the scriptures witness to his life. He's saying uh, the Old Testament is really about him. Without him, the Old Testament promises and covenants could never be fulfilled. So this is astonishing to try to get your mind around this. But our Christ is the Christ of scripture. If you want to know the whole counsel of God, uh, you need to know who Jesus Christ, and you need to know that the whole Bible points to him. He is at the center and the orbit of the whole story of redemption. This is why he's called the Savior. Uh, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Next, we see that Jesus is the promised Messiah. We see this as a case in point in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Peter's confession of who Jesus is is really a, a mountain peak passage in the Gospel of Matthew. And, and this question, quite honestly, is quite relevant today. Uh, people want to know who is Jesus? What is his uh, true identity? Uh, there, there existed at that time different views of, as to who Jesus was. Uh, most of these views were really, quite honestly, they were positive, but they were inadequate. And Jesus asked his disciples, yeah, but who do you say that I am? It's a great question. And Peter replies, representing the 11 others, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now here, here is a, just a clear confession that Jesus is the Messiah He's the anointed of God. He's the long-awaited one, the promised one. And he's also the son of the living God, which refers to his divine sonship. As we see in, in Psalm chapter 2, in the Davidic covenant, in 2 Samuel 7, Jesus' relationship to God is son, the only son. No one else is in such intimate relationship with God, except really by adoption. We see this in, in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, this is a statement of his divine nature. It, it is divine sonship, Jesus' messianic deity. Jesus responds to Peter's declaration with a, a beatitude, you know, blessed are you. Peter did not make this declaration by his own strength or intelligence, we're told. God the Father in heaven revealed his son to Peter. It was, it was a gift from the Father, Jesus makes clear. And so we know that Peter is totally right in his evaluation of Christ. It wasn't, you know, he wasn't guessing. It wasn't a good guess. He wasn't taking a wager. He wasn't inventing, you know, the Jesus of his own imagination. It was the revelation of the Father concerning the Son. And if you want to know the difference between the true church and the false church, or the difference between a true shepherd, a true pastor or elder, and a false teacher then ask, what do they confess about Christ? The true Christ is built on Christ as the divine Messiah, his divine sonship. He, he builds the church by his death, burial, and resurrection. Everything, and I mean everything, centers around who is Christ and what has he done. Every pastoral elder needs to confess Christ's divine 
sonship, just like Peter did. I hate to even have to say that, but it's necessary. Like Peter, the elder is to be Christocentric. The third thing is the virgin birth of the Messiah. The birth of Jesus is an essential part of the gospel story. Both uh, the gospels of Matthew and Luke expressly state that Jesus was born of a virgin that, and that his birth was a supernatural event. Matthew 1 directly states that before Mary and Joseph came together physically, she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, Mary was a virgin. Jesus is not the biological son of Joseph, uh, but he is the son of Mary. Both Joseph and Mary are in the line of King David. In a dream, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, confirming that Mary had conceived a child as a result of the Holy Spirit's work within her body. Uh, the angel went on to explain that she will bear a son and they shall call him Jesus. And his mission is to save his people from their sins. Matthew then says that this took place as the prophet Isaiah prophesied. Behold, a virgin shall, be, uh, shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is called, this whole thing is called the Incarnation. The Luke account adds that because the child is born of the Holy Spirit, the child would be called Holy, the Son of God. The angel Gabriel goes on to tell Mary that the Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Israel forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. This is the same uh, words used in 2 Samuel 7 of the Davidic covenant. This is no normal, natural birth. This is no ordinary person. This is God's anointed one, the Messiah. And so the virgin birth is really part of his sinless life. And this all culminates with his preparation for offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. One interesting reason for the virgin birth of Christ is that God pronounced a curse on Jeconiah because of uh, the continuous line of sin. The curse said that uh, none of his descendants, Jeconiah's descendants, would ever be on the throne of David. Uh, we read this in Jeremiah chapter 22. Essentially, Joseph's physical son could not sit on the throne of David, interestingly enough. This entire story is either true and a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, or else it's a huge joke. It's not true at all. And if that's the case, why even read the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of Luke? Why trust the writer? No one should be made an elder who does not affirm the virgin birth of Christ. 